Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to our service this morning, coming from St. Paul's United Methodist Church here in Brick, New Jersey. We are so glad to have you join us, albeit virtually online through Facebook Live or YouTube. And we are looking forward to the time when we will be able to regather in the sanctuary at some in some form or fashion. And we will let you know as we are approaching that date. We're not really sure when that be when that's going to be, but uh, I think uh, there's a number of things that we need to do before we get to that point, especially getting the governor's permission to meet with more than 10 people. And uh, so we are working hard on getting prepared for that. It may be somewhere around the end of this month, probably around the second week of July is my guess, but uh, maybe before that, we'll let you know. But we really miss being together. We miss seeing you and we are glad to have this contact, this opportunity to meet together in spirit and in worship as we come together. I wanna to greet you in Jesus name. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood and God has blessed us with a glorious day. This is indeed the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it together. As we gather, I wanna add a couple of announcements for you and begin with a word of prayer want to just remind you that there are all kinds of things happening today in the life and ministry of St. Paul's United Methodist Church. Our college career age group is meeting by Instagram or Zoom at two o'clock and uh, you can check in with Melissa on that. Also our youth group will be meeting online by way of Zoom or Instagram at six o'clock today. Then 11 o'clock on Wednesday morning, we have our Wednesday morning prayer check-in, a Wednesday morning scripture and prayer time in which we follow up on all the prayer requests that have been shared during this broadcast. During this time, we invite you to share prayer requests. We respond to them immediately after or as we go along Wednesday morning, we have a time of specifically praying for those prayer concerns. And uh, I also want to just invite anyone who has graduates, anybody graduating from high school or college, send us your pictures so that we can post them on our Facebook Live page and congratulate you. In two weeks, we will be celebrating Dad's and Grad's Day, Father's Day, and graduation recognition. So if you would like to send us pictures that we can post as we recognize and celebrate this great achievement by our graduates, please feel free to do that. As I said, if you want to share prayer requests um, or responses of any sort, please do that as we go along. But we are glad to be together. And uh, I am glad that you have tuned in, checked in with us this morning. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your awesome, incredible love for us. We thank you for the promise of your presence. As two or more are gathered in your name, we gather, Lord, in your name. As you have promised, we know that you are here. We know that you are with us wherever we are by your Holy Spirit who is everywhere we are. We ask, Lord, that you would fill us to overflowing with your love. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. It prompts us to worship you in spirit and in truth as you desire, as you deserve. We exalt you, we praise you, we worship you with all of our hearts, minds, and soul. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'd like to turn things over to our youth director, Hector Meza. And uh, I want to thank, before I do that, I want to just thank Melissa and Mike Jensen for their participation in these services. Also, Dave Cavanaugh and Hector and Lydia 
as they are with us coming to us by link through Zoom from their living room. So I'm gonna turn things over to them at this time. All right, so thanks, Pastor, and uh, welcome everybody into our, our home once more. Uh, it's good to have all of you here with us uh, together, uh, and you are all welcome. Um, I, to, today we're going to be uh, participating in, uh, in the Lord's Supper, and uh, I wanted to share with you all a, a little story of a, uh, a meal that Jesus had with him. Jesus was like always partying, right? He was always having meals together with people. And this is a story uh, that comes from Mark chapter 2 uh, that uh, is, is, is a time where he had a, a feast with, with uh, some people. Uh, so I'll be reading Mark chapter 2 and we'll start at verse 13. And it reads, Now Jesus went to the lake again, and many people followed him there. So Jesus taught them. He was walking beside the lake, and he saw a man named Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Levi was sitting at his place for uh, collecting taxes because he was a tax collector. Jesus said to him, Follow me. Then Levi stood up and followed Jesus. Later that day, Jesus and his followers ate at Levi's house. There were also many tax collectors and others with bad reputations eating with them. Some of them were called sinners. There were many of these people who followed Jesus also. When some teachers of the law who were Pharisees, they saw Jesus eating with such bad people, they asked his followers, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, It is the sick people who need a doctor, not those who are healthy. I did not come to invite good people. I came to invite sinners. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, a birthday party that wasn't your own, right? Um, and, and let's say that you show up to the birthday party and all of a sudden, somebody that you don't like shows up there too. You know, maybe they're from, uh, they, they, they're wearing a jersey from a, a team that's different than yours or they go to a school that's, that's a rival school that maybe you don't like. Uh, maybe they're wearing a shirt that you just, wah, you just don't like the way it looks, or, or maybe they have red hair or short hair or long hair or no hair. And you just, you know, I don't know. You just don't really like that person, right? Cause they're different from you. Now you wouldn't have the right to say to that person, you know what? You need to leave this party. Why? Because it's not your party, right? It's not your choice. And so what, what we see in this story is, is similar to that, right? The Pharisees show up and, and, and they show up at this party that Jesus is at. And it's a party for Jesus, right? And they're saying, oh, well, we don't, we don't like those people. There's something, there's, there's, there's something not right about them. And Jesus' response is so awesome. You know, it was, it was like Jesus was giving everybody a reminder that, you know what? I'm God here. And if I'm God in my kingdom, there's no room for, for uh, people not being allowed in, right? Jesus is saying, everybody needs me. And in fact, the only people that don't show up at Jesus' feast are people that don't want, don't want to be there. Or that say, you know what, Jesus? I really don't need you. I don't need to be made well. Well, if... if this coronavirus pandemic has taught us anything is that we all need rescuing, right? None of us are safe. And so Jesus came to die for all of us. Every single one of us needs him. We're all the same in that regard. We all bleed the same color blood. And so you may have heard about, you know, uh, uh, just, just people marching and, and angry uh, with racism. And it's right. They should be. Because in Jesus' kingdom, at Jesus' party, there's no room for that. He invites us all. Because we all need him. We all need forgiveness. Now let's, let's go and talk to our Heavenly Father together as a church family, knowing that there's people all over this world that are doing the same thing. We get to join together with, with people from all over the world and talking to our awesome and powerful God.
there is only one God. There's not a God of black people, not a God of white people, not a God of Hispanic people, not a God of China, you know, uh, Asian people, God. There, there, there is just one God. Let's go and talk to him now, together. Oh, great God, you are awesome and majestic. There really is no other God. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that you are in control, that you are good, and that we can look up to you, God, that we can cry out to you, Lord. We're not left here as orphans. We're, we're not uh, forgotten or, or, or overlooked, God. Thank you, God, that we are your children, that we are your people. And it's not because of our goodness. It's because of your sacrifice, Jesus. So we thank you again for taking that punishment that we deserve, for dying for all of our sins and all of our evils and all the wrong things that we continue to do, God. Thank you so much for loving us. God, we look forward to that day where every knee shall bow. Every tongue is going to say that, Jesus, you are Lord. We thank you, God, that we can declare that now. We thank you, God, that, uh, that in, in, your, in your kingdom, Lord, there's no room for, for those divisions, God. Thank you for tearing down that dividing wall for that, that curtain that, that stood in the way. And we thank you for, for drawing us close to you, God. Because we couldn't do it. We're not good enough. No matter how hard we try. Thank you, God, for, for kneeling down and for coming down to us. And Lord, you, you, you came down not just for our, our salvation of our souls, God, but also the healing of our bodies, of our minds, of our hearts. And Lord, we still need that healing, God. There's so many of us that are hurting and broken in so many ways, God. There's so many of us that have fears and anxieties, God, worries. Lord, we, we place all those before you, God. Our, our broken bodies, our broken minds and hearts, Lord. We know that you're good. And, uh, and so we ask for your healing, God. We ask to be able to see what it's going to be like in heaven. Just a little foretaste right here on earth. God, we pray for those that, that are really struggling right now and, and, and are needing a job, uh, are, are needing food and, and clothing and a home, Lord. God, we pray for uh, those doctors and nurses and everyone that's providing care for, for those that are still uh, suffering through this pandemic, God. Lord, we, we pray for those business owners and, and, and people that are, are just worried about, about their jobs, Lord. We continue, God, just to pray for wisdom for our leaders as they make decisions about opening up. And, and God, help us to be smart. God, help us to be wise. Help us to, to care and protect each other, Lord. And we thank you for, for the decreases that we've seen in, in certain areas, God. But we know that there's still increases, that there's still people that are hurting. Help us, Lord. God, we pray for, for our brothers and sisters, and especially in parts of, of this world where it's dangerous to be a Christian, God. Please protect them, God. Please, Lord, even in, the, in, in our difficulties, may we see more and more people come to trust you. Help us, Lord, God. Give us the words. Give us the actions to, to, to do, God, that more and more people might, may know how great you are, how worthy of praise you are. God, we thank you for being such a giver, for being such a comforter, Lord. We thank you, God, for, for being our protector, God. You are our, our, our rescuer. So we thank you, God, for hearing us. Even, even when we, we, we make mistakes and we sin against you and against others, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. So, Lord, we pray these things and, and may, many of the other things that are left unsaid. And we pray in the way that you taught. And you said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We uh, thank you uh, once more for, uh, for being a part of our church. 
uh, for being a part of the, the ministry being done here um, and, and following in God's example of, of being givers. Um, we thank you for that. And uh, as, as we enter into uh, just an attitude of, of giving and thanksgiving, uh, Lydia is going to come and share a song.
so much, Lydia. That was awesome. As always, I praise God for his table, and we will be celebrating communion together at the end of this time in worship, and so I want to remind you, if you haven't already gathered the elements of communion there in your home, bread or crackers or anything like unto that, and grape juice or any kind of juice or even water or whatever you have there in your home, have those ready after my message this morning. These have been difficult days the last two weeks, almost two weeks since the murder of George Floyd. My heart is heavy and aching and I believe God, God's heart is as well for all of the tension, all of the chaos as weeks of protest, demonstration have been going on. I gave a short message about this on Wednesday, but many people don't tune in on Wednesday. So I wanna just briefly reiterate that as I launch into this morning's service. And sermon. I believe that this is a very trying time in our lives for many reasons as we watch all the things that are going on around our world, especially in our nation, on our city streets, and even in our local communities. The riots, the looting on top of that, raging backlash and racial tension stirred up by just the latest of these violent murders, the evidence of racial tension, in this case perpetrated by a certain police officer. Add to that the potential for coronavirus, COVID-19 spreading, especially through social proximity of these protests and gatherings. Add to that the dis domestic tension in our home as we are cooped up together with families in close proximity during this quarantine. All that sums up and equals anxiety, stress, and fear as we go forward. As we watch signs on TV that say no justice, no peace, I have to respond by saying we need to have justice and we need to have peace. One is not conditioned on the other both in equal measure are important to God. I believe a God of justice and a God of peace, a God of love and a God of joy. 
We need to know Jesus that we might know justice and peace. Without him, I don't believe there can be real justice or peace. Tony Evans, great radio preacher and pastor, 10,000 member church in Dallas, Texas, author, speaker, at conferences, has been quoted saying, this is not a skin problem, but a sin problem. This is not a race issue, but it's a grace issue. Yes, black lives matter. And blue lives matter. All lives matter. And it doesn't diminish the fact that the lives of minorities, whether they be African Americans, Hispanic, Asian, any group, any significance is not diminished by saying that all lives matter. Blue lives matter, black lives matter. All of us matter to God and therefore must matter to one another. God has created all of us and therefore we all are made in God's image and have sacred worth. That is the foundation of our response to today's concerns. As I look at the days, at the events of these days, I can't help but remember and think back when I was young, when I was growing up in the 60s. Most of you can't remember the 60s. You're too young for that. But I was around in the 60s. I remember songs like What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love, sung by Jackie DeShannon or Dionne Warwick, covered that a couple years later, back in 1965 or 66. Everlasting Love, sung by Robert Knight, back in 1967. Remember that? We've heard it replayed, I'm sure. Or All You Need Is Love, sung by the Beatles in 1967. Then they broke up. But anyhow, they were right. All we need is love. And I can't forget My Love by Petula Clark. My love is warmer than the warmest sunshine, softer than a sigh. My love is deeper than the deepest ocean, wider than the sky. I forget the rest of it, but it's also higher than the highest mountain and other things. Anyhow, this, these songs came out of an age of chaos and craziness. The 60s were a difficult time with the war. The civil rights mo- movement was at its height. And we now are remembering and reflecting on those same sentiments. We need love. This world needs love. You and I need love. And God is love. We need God. I want to pick up where we left off last week, where we talked about the spirit of God for Pentecost Sunday. God has not given us a spirit of timidity and fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. A spirit of love. Actually, not only am I going back to last week, but going back to our Lenten series in which we were examining Jesus' teachings, the Bible's commands of one another, including serve one another, be kind to one another, love one another. Actually, I didn't get to that in that series because we switched over to talk about facing down fear in the midst of the corona pandemic. But today I want to revisit that and pick up with at least this other one another. So, This morning, I want to read for you a passage of scripture. If you have your Bible with us, I am in 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John, 
first, second, third, John, Jude, Revelation, right at the end of the scriptures. I'm looking at chapter four, verses seven through 21, the end of the chapter. First John chapter four, beginning with verse seven. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. So we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, his love is made complete in us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. He who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. He has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. It all begins with God's love for us. This morning, let me say over and over and over again, God loves us. God loves you. That's where it all starts. The gospel, the good news for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a message for the whole world, but it's also a message for you and me as individuals. It's particular and special, God's love for each one of us is powerful and significant. Even if you were the only one who lived and sinned and needed a savior, God loves you and sent his son for you Personally, you can put your name in the place of the word world there in John 3.16. He loves you. Do you feel that love this morning? Do you feel the fullness of his love breaking in? God's love is preeminent. It is supreme. It is above all other Love divine, all loves excelling. Any other love you may experience pales in comparison for God's love is preeminent. God's love is prevenient. It goes before all others. People often ask, who fell in love first, Alan? You or Bev? And um, I don't know. I think it was the same instant when we saw each other. Whoa. Anyhow, doesn't matter who fell in love first in that case. Both of us were loved by God and in love with him. And that love 
comes before prevenient love. God's love is also prerequisite, necessary for all other loves. Any other kind of love in your life flows from the source of God's love. Prerequisite. God's love is unconditional. No matter what you've done or where you've been, God loves you. And it's not conditioned on how you look, how you behave. We'll come back to that. God's love is uncontainable. You can't measure God's love in a bucket. You can't carry God's love, confine God's love. It's uncontainable. And God's love is unceasing. It is eternal. Jeremiah 31 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God tells us, I have drawn you with loving kindness. That in the midst of one of the most depressing books of the Bible, God's prophecy of judgment against the people of Israel in the Old Testament times, just before the exile, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, the word of God came to him and said, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. That word is for you and for me. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Romans 8, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger, or the sword, and I might add the COVID virus in 2020? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This morning, know deep in your soul that God loves you. This morning, feel God's embrace by his love and grace. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, nothing can change that or diminish that. I've said it before. Nothing you could do could make God love you more. God loves you with an infinite love. And you can't earn that. You can't do anything to, to gain that. Nothing that you do makes him love you more. And along with that, nothing you could do could make God love you less. Nothing you could do could make God love you less. Be saturated in your soul by God's love. Be immersed in the fullness of his powerful love so that you might love him in return. Because God loves us. We love God. That's the greatest command in the Old Testament. The Shema, the, the watchword for all of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. One God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Wholeheartedly. With every fiber of your being, love God because he first loved you. Jesus reinforced this command in all of the Gospels in the New Testament. Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Asked, what is the greatest command? Jesus said, you've heard it. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your mind, all of your heart, all your strength. Our love for God is responsive. It is reflexive. It is returning as a response to him. 1 John 4, 19, as I read, we love God because he first 
loved us. Who wouldn't love someone who loves so completely? As people in this world love you with the greatest of their abilities to love, maybe it's in your family, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your dog, I don't. Whoever loves, loves with a reflection of God's love. And it's hard not to love someone with a love like that. Our love for God is expressed in our devotion, in our worship, in our obedience. We express our love. We say, Lord, I love you in our prayers, our praises, our service, as we read in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus told his disciples. Whoever loves lives in me and I in him. As I am in the Father, so is he with you. We love because God we love God because he first loved us. And that carries over in a response to loving one another. We love others because God's love flows through us. The second response, next to our love for God in response, we come to love others made in God's image. Jesus said, the second greatest command is like unto the first, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, new command, said, I give you a new command to love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. For greater love has no one in this than a man lay down his life for his friend. Jesus laid down his life for us and showed us the perfect pattern of premier preeminent love. Our love for one another is a, an assurance that we belong to him, an assurance of salvation according to this passage, evidence that we have been born again, that our hearts have been regenerated. 1 John 4, 7, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 16, whoever lives in love lives in God and lives in him. Yes, none of us has perfect love within us, but if we have some love for one another, that's a sign that we are God's, that God lives in us that his spirit has awakened the fruit of his love in our hearts. And this, by this, we are a witness to a watching world. By this shall all men know that you were my disciples, Jesus said. People in this world all around us are watching to see if we show evidence that we are really Christians or whether we're hypocrites. And actually God has given them the right to make that judgment. He has said, by this, people will know that you are my disciples. We must love one another. So love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no justification for racial pre prejudice, none whatsoever. There's no justification for injustice and oppression. There's no justification for unkindness and a lack of compassion for disciples of Jesus Christ. There's no justification for harm and harsh incivility in conversation or treatment for anyone. We are all loved by God. And we must love one another well. There's no such thing as the rationalization. Well, I have every right to be 
angry and do what I did. No, you don't. God doesn't give us the right to hurt and harm one another or anybody else. God loves you. I pray that you will feel that in the deepest fiber of your being. I pray today that you will know that in the deepest knowing of your existence so that you will love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength and love one another as much. All people are created by God with sacred worth. So let us love the way he loved us. Agape, perfect love. Love like this, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Don't you hate that? It starts off with getting hit in the face. Patience, really? Love is patient. Love is kind. Doesn't get any easier. Does not envy. Does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Keeps no record of wrongs. Don't come to me with a list of grievances. Love to which we are charged keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, for love never fails. And these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So let us live in God's love. Let us live in love with one another. and Be a shining beacon of God's love to this world in chaos. Today and forever. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the immensity of your amazing love. Capture our hearts, Lord, with the heart that you have for us. Fill our hearts to overflowing with your amazing love and grace. Enable us to respond to others, not by how they treat us, but by how you've treated us. Enable us to watch with compassion this world hurting in pain. Help us to stand for right, for righteousness, justice, and truth. Help us, Lord, to stand in compassion, kindness, and love. Today, especially, and forever, as long as you deem it our place to be in this world. Love through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to join me in a time at the table of the Lord that Lydia sang about. You don't have to be a member of St. Paul's United Methodist Church or any Methodist Church or any church for that matter to be welcome and invited to this celebration, to this feast of the Lord's Supper. Again, I'm going to be using the order of service that we use on Wednesday evenings for our midweek worship, seven o'clock on Wednesday evenings, as Jesus invites us to his table. We know that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. As we gather this morning for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, we hear again the story of God's mighty acts of love embodied in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. With thanksgiving, we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, 
and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. We are given assurance of the Lord's presence through the gift of his Holy Spirit as we come to him. We come with prayers of confession. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We have had anxieties about the future, even though we proclaim you as Lord. We have failed to love our neighbors. We have disobeyed your commands. Have mercy upon us, Lord Jesus. Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we may walk in your ways and serve you in grace and love. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And now, in consecration, again, in prayer, Gracious Lord, bless this time and all who gather with us in this way. Bless these gifts of bread and cup that they may be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless our hearts that we may receive these gifts we do not deserve and remember Jesus' death and passion and be partakers of the divine nature through him who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. We are one body, made one by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Take this bread. Remember him. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Jesus said, this cup is a cup of a new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Take and drink, drink this. Know deeply, profoundly in your heart and soul that God loves you, that Jesus died for you, and be thankful. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your sacrifice of love. We thank you for this memorial meal in which we remember your great love. We thank you that by your love, we can be made to be lovers, lovers of you and lovers of one another. Shed your love abroad in our hearts that we might spread this good news abroad in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. I'm going to turn things over to Lydia again for our closing hymn, a hymn of response to our time together and God's word. If you have downloaded the words to this hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling on the internet. You're welcome to sing it with us.
Thank you so much, Lydia. And we thank all of you for your prayers, for your generosity, for your presence with us as we gather together. Sunday mornings, Wednesday mornings, we thank you and love you. Thank you that you stand with us, keeping us strong as we go forward in these difficult days. And now receive the blessing of God. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power with all the saints together to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and to Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.